Welcome back. So I'm really excited in this lecture to tell you about something called the Gabor transform, which is used to compute the spectrogram. So this is part of our section on the Fourier transform. So um, essentially we're used to thinking about the Fourier transform as taking some signal either in space or in time and writing it in terms of its frequency components, okay? So for example, um, I can take a, um, audio signal and I can Fourier transform it and I can pull out what are the, the kind of individual frequency components that, that add up to make that audio signal, okay? And um, I'm just gonna draw some pictures here. So imagine I have some time series data. I've got some, you know, maybe this is an audio recording of, uh, you know, I have a microphone in some symphony hall and I'm listening to, you know, someone play a piano, okay? And what I can do is I can Fourier transform this signal, and in the frequency domain now, so now this is a function of, of some frequency with units of hertz, this had units of seconds, maybe uh, I can see spikes, Fourier uh, spikes in the power spectrum corresponding to individual uh, tones on, on that piano. So maybe each individual key will, will come as a spike in this frequency uh, with, a, with power determined by how much um, kind of that, that key was played in that song, okay? But this gets to the heart of, of the spectrogram and the Gabor transform is this idea that if I look at my signal as a function of time, I, I have precision information about where in time uh, I am, but I don't know what the frequency is at that instant in time, okay? It could be, it's some combination of frequencies. Similarly, when I Fourier transform, I have exquisite information about exactly what frequencies were played in that song, but I don't know when, you know, maybe this is the, the C, um, you know, key or, you know, a low C or something. I know exactly what frequencies were played, but I don't know when they were played in the song. That's a big problem. So in time domain, I know where my signal is in time, but I don't know anything about the instantaneous frequencies. Here, I know everything about what frequencies were played, but I don't know where they occurred in time. This is what the Gabor transform is going to allow us to figure out. So the Gabor transform, uh, the Gabor transform is going to allow us to compute something called the spectrogram the spectrogram, which essentially is a time frequency plot of what frequencies are active in specific instances in time. So it's kind of a map evolving in time of what frequencies are being played. I always think about this in terms of, you know, the piano or a guitar music, right? So the music has frequencies that are, that are evolving in time, and this Gabor transform is going to allow us to pull out both the frequency content and the temporal information of that signal. Okay, and this is really, really important uh, is this idea that the Fourier transform really makes sense for signals that are perfectly periodic, something that is completely periodic and repeating. And audio signals are not like that. They have frequency content, but one second of audio is rarely gonna be periodically repeated in the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth seconds. So someone's voice speaking or someone playing you know, a symphony uh, or some song on a piano, it has frequency components at each instant in time, but they're not periodic in time, okay? And so, so this is what the, the Gabor transform is going to give us. And so what we do in the Gabor transform is instead of computing the Fourier transform over the entire uh, temporal domain, what we do is we take a little Gaussian window, some, some fixed width window, and we convolve our Fourier transform with this little Gaussian window sliding across our signal. So basically we are computing a weighted Fourier transform only in this window and we're moving that window uh, across, we're sliding that window across the signal in time. And so the result of this Gabor transform is we will have a time frequency plot, okay, so we'll have some resolution in time and we'll have some resolution in frequency. And so for example, if I take this first Gabor window, I basically compute the Fourier transform of this little section of my data and I get some, 
you know, maybe these keys are being hit on the piano. And then as I slide this forward in time, now maybe there's different frequency content in the next instant. Maybe now there's some different frequency content. These keys are being played and so on and so forth. As this evolves in time, you see this kind of different uh, pattern of frequencies that are uh, evolving in time. Okay, so each vertical strip of this spectrogram, so this is my spectrogram, and each vertical strip is basically a power spectrum for a little short window of time. And I have this moving window, this is sliding across, giving me a sliding power spectrum of what frequencies are being played as time evolves. So this is really useful, this tells me not just what frequencies are active in my, in my system, but when they occurred. Okay, so it's somehow kind of the hybrid between these two pictures. We have some temporal resolution and some frequency resolution. Now, you can't have as much frequency resolution or as much time resolution in this spectrogram, and so there's always a trade-off based on how wide this window is, kind of how much resolution you have in time or in frequency. Okay, but this can be pretty useful. So for example, um, you know, if I, if I make some noise, I start with a low frequency, and then I increase the frequency, you can see kind of that, that temporal evolution of that frequency going from low to high in time. Okay, and that's really, really cool. And you can only get that using this kind of Gabor transform, uh, which, which gives rise to the spectrogram. Okay, now mathematically, this is actually really, really simple. It's basically built on uh, the Fourier transform, so you can use the fast Fourier transform to compute this. And what you do is if you had some signal um, f, let's call this f of t, then your Gabor transform of f is gonna be this function uh, f hat sub g, this is just telling us it's a Gabor transform, and it's gonna be a function of both time and frequency. So unlike the Fourier transform, this is going to be a function of time and frequency. So it's a, you know, kind of a dual function. And it's going to be given by basically the Fourier transform, so an integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of tau e to the minus i omega tau. But now I'm going to multiply it by this little Gaussian uh, Gabor window here, this little Gaussian function g of tau. I'm going to multiply it by g of t minus tau, uh, d tau. Okay, so this Gabor transform of f is basically just the Fourier transform of f, but weighted by this little Gaussian window that's sliding across. Okay, so I get something that's a function of frequency because I'm Fourier transforming, but that is in this sliding window that's pinned to this particular time t. So now I have something that's a function of both omega and t uh, in, this, in this spectrogram. Okay, so this is the Gabor transform. It's just a Fourier transform weighted by this little Gaussian that is sliding across in time. And so it gives you some resolution of what frequencies are active, but it also gives you some resolution of when those frequencies are active in time. So it's this kind of, uh, this time frequency diagram. Very, very useful uh, Gabor transform and spectrogram. Okay, so I uh, think this is an extremely powerful method for analyzing data, okay? So oftentimes when you get a time series of, of data, maybe I put my phone on the hood of my car and I'm listening to it do its thing, um, you can use the spectrogram to pull out features in that data. So I have colleagues who use the spectrogram uh, to classify sounds in the ocean, okay? So they're, they're doing measurements in the ocean on a boat and they wanna tell if someone, you know, dropped a chain on the boat or if some, you know, a whale just swam by or if, you know, if something is happening, it usually shows itself as some kind of evolving frequency signature in time in the spectrogram. So oftentimes when you wanna classify audio signals, you wanna take your signal and not just transform to the Fourier series, or the, the, the Fourier domain, you wanna to transform to this spectrogram domain, this, this Gabor transform, okay? Um, this is how Shazam uh, can classify music. So for example, if you are listening to a song and you wanna know what it is, you hold your phone up with Shazam, what it does is it basically finds peaks in the power spectrum 
and it tries to match this kind of sparse template of peaks to a library of known songs. And this is kind of interesting. I didn't know this until, um, until recently. When you listen to songs on the radio, they can stretch them out or shrink them by, you know, maybe 10% faster or slower, and the human ear has a hard time recognizing, you know, those, those small changes, speed ups and slowdowns, but the radio stations will stretch out the song or shrink them to fit a slot uh, between the, the commercial breaks. And so that makes it a little bit harder for the Shazam algorithm to match these peaks, and they have to do something a little bit more clever, figuring out if I slowed my song down or sped it up, how would this spectrogram scale, um, you know, in time and frequency? So that's kind of an interesting problem problem that the Shazam algorithm uses, okay? Uh, you can also, for example, classify, you know, if I have some song being played, I can also classify was it played on a guitar or a piano? Was it played on an electric guitar or an acoustic guitar? Because, you know, these individual notes being played might look different. They might, you know, have a little bit of a, a trill or some signature of what instrument they were played on, or even who played those notes. So I would uh, pose to you that if you wanted to, for example, classify um, you know, different musicians, so you want to see if it was Jimi Hendrix playing this song, you might be able to do that by pulling features out of this spectrogram. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you how to code this up soon. We're gonna look at some examples of how to do a chirp, how to do uh, the spectrogram of, a, of an audio signal. But I'm gonna pull up one of my favorite videos. This is um, actually a YouTube video from, uh, from Jan K. So I hope it's okay to, to show this. I think this is a great video that they made. It's one of my favorites. This is... Um, a spectrogram of Beethoven's sonata, and you can just see it playing here. I'm gonna hit play, I'm gonna turn my volume up. So you can see the slider moving across the screen. And you can see that every note is one of these dark black kind of uh, signatures in this, in this spectrogram plot. So this is really neat. You can actually kind of see um, when the keys are being played, how they're being played. You can tell when it's gonna get more active or less active. And, you know, I think it's also interesting, I always joke with my class, you know, Beethoven didn't have 50 fingers. These are kind of harmonics uh, that are being generated in the piano uh, from these chords. And so you can see all of that uh, rich, rich structure in this, in this spectrogram. Okay, good. So in the next couple of lectures, I'm going to code this up. We're going to actually uh, work with the spectrogram and look at this, this time frequency diagram for a few different uh, audio signals. Okay, thank you.